Our songs take us a lot of places. Uh, it takes us to the happy times of the creation that God enjoined upon man and shared with man. And it takes us oftentimes even prior to the coming of man when the Bible speaks of God telling of the coming of Jesus Christ. Paul talked about in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Our songs talk about those things like that. They bring to our attention the, the wonder of the, the power of God. When we talk about uh, the, the making of man and fearfully and wonderfully were made. It uh, talks about uh, the, the voice of the, the shepherd and it talks about the power of the creation. It talks about the handiwork of God. It talks about the salvation of man and what man has in Jesus Christ. Our songs take us a lot of places. But all of them tend to point to, and they should, that we could lift our voices and praise God in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. I think we have complied with the wishes of God tonight. When we think about, we have uh, used songs that remind us of our own responsibility. Bring them in. There's something we can do. There's something that we should be doing. And um, may we be those, as the Lord suggested. And one of the last things that he shared with man was, I want you to go into all the world. He was speaking specifically, I understand that. But there's a general application of sowing the seed and so, you brethren, you, you have chosen to do that again this year as, as you have the gospel meeting and as we gather together to worship, we try to encourage each other to build each other up in the most holy faith. And um, we think oftentimes about what we can do and, and how it can be done in harmony with the will of God and reach the souls of man. But there isn't any way that excludes the teaching of God's Word. There isn't any other way to reach man than by the power of the, of the preaching of the gospel because it's God's power to save the soul of man. And so we will be satisfied with that. We have a desire to continue to do that. We believe it is best because it's the way God is chosen. And in God all things are yes or yea as we would say and as the scripture relates to us. I want to continue tonight as I mentioned about looking at uh, point number one uh, in our study, God's family, their names and their places. And we looked at the fact that there are many things that we can look at and there are many points that can be made. There are many names that relate to uh, the different powers and entities and workers and members in the body of Christ. And specifically, we, we began last night looking at members and some of the things that surround it. I want to be more specific with you tonight about that, and we'll introduce some other things very likely in our study. But I would like for us to, to return to the fact that there are those that are members of the body of Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 14, the body is not one member, but the body is many members. And so I mentioned to you there's 40-something different designations in the New Testament of those who are members in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In the kingdom of Jesus Christ, we have the Father. And the Father of certainly is the one that has given Jesus Christ the authority for, them, for him to have the kingdom in the first place. And we could spend a lot of time about the Father, and no doubt you've had a lot of lessons along that line, so we're not going to spend a lot of time along that. There's some other points that I think that are less taught and, and less likely to be possibly shared and mentioned, and we'll... We'll talk about some of them. In the body, the Bible identifies that there are things that are the comely parts and there are the things that are not the comely parts. And then in that verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul said, but now as God set the members, every one of them in the body. And so in the body of Christ, there are angels. 
and God set them in the body. In the body of Christ, there are apostles, and God set them in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, there are prophets, and God set the prophets in the body of Christ. There are prophetesses, as the Bible identifies them, and, and God has set them. There are a lot of these, as we mentioned and we'll be looking at, that they've played their part. they finished their course. Their, their place is no longer needed. They have fulfilled that which God intended for them. That's true of the death of Christ. That was part of the coming of the kingdom of God. And, and that's been accomplished. That's been fulfilled. We don't need Jesus, as some religions would tell us, that he constantly is dying again, a, a bloodless sacrifice. And they, they teach that he, he dies over and over and over and over again. But we don't need that. He fulfilled his purpose. He died once, the Bible identifies, and, and so we're satisfied with that. And we know we don't need that anymore. There need to be the revelation of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. There had to be the, the validation of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And so God chose men to be able to fulfill certain functions and have certain responsibilities and possess certain powers that they could validate such. And their work has been completed. Perfect law of liberty was not given on the day of Pentecost. There were a number of things that were understood yet to be taught and they began to be revealed and then it began to be recorded, and then we have it finalized, and it is there today for us to have the perfect law of liberty. And the message is, is a genuine and a wonderful message. In the New Testament age, all the saved must be faithful members of the Lord's church, regardless of gender. I want to, I want to spend a lot of time on that point tonight. I want you to understand tonight that being members of the Lord's church does not give you liberties and freedoms outside of the guidelines of he who is the head of the body. Notice this carefully. There is in the New Testament age those who are identified as the saved of God and they are saved because they are faithful members of the Lord's church whether it be male or female, whether it be bond or free, all members must work with the rest of the entire body to help the body with its life and to sustain its living. The scripture identifies the futility and the warning of God against an individual that would be a stumbling block to any of God's people. There is a need for all members to join in with the rest of the body and be unified with all of the other parts. We're to work in harmony. Now let's look at some of the blessings of being a member of the Lord's church and the Lord's church being the Lord's body and the Lord's body is a healthy body. Now how do you know that? Well the Lord doesn't have a diseased body. And I want us to think about that very carefully and even completely. I want you to understand the Lord's going to protect his body. And he's not going to allow his body to be contaminated. And he's not going to allow his body to be leavened. That's the way you and I are. You get a very uh, nasty piece of metal stuck in your finger or in the side of your head or in your leg, you're not going to leave it there. You're going to remove it from your body. If you've got any intelligence at all and any care of the health of the rest of your body, you're not going to let that come into your body and infect your body and make you sick to where your feet are not going to be able to function as they need to and your hands are not going to be able to function as they need to and your body is not going to be able to go ahead and fulfill its obligations. And I want you to know that's the way it is with the Lord's body. The Lord is not going to let anything come into His body that's going to destroy it. Now people, you say, well, I, I, I know people that allow things in the church. I... I'm not talking about what is allowed in a congregation by the leadership and the members. 
Because the Lord has superiority over all of that and he can remove that congregation from his body if such that they choose to bring in the leaven that would leaven the whole lump. And so we, these are some of the points that I think we can all understand and, and we need to be aware of. We're not going to make the Lord accept what he does not and will not accept. We're not going to make the Lord go along with what He's not going to go along with. We're not going to get the Lord to justify what He can't justify. We're not going to get Him to sanction what is not sanctionable. He's not going to call that which is faithful, which is unfaithful. There's a time the Old Testament writer talked about when there would be those that would call something good that wouldn't be good. And something evil when it was actually good. And so let's look at this in light of the fact tonight as God's family, we have a certain place to fulfill in that family of God. For the Lord has set all members in the body as it pleased Him. We should never be disgruntled at the fact that the Lord won't let us be apostles. Did you know that there was not one of our sisters that was an apostle? Never was allowed. But there's a whole bunch of us were, that were never allowed and will never be allowed to be the apostles. It's the same thing as it was in the days of Moses. Not all could work the miracles that Moses and Aaron could work. But did that make them any less the people of God? Not in one bit of consideration. They were all God's family. They were all needful in God's family. They all had a part and a place in God's family. God just simply used Moses and Aaron to be greater servants, to carry a heavier burden, to walk a harder path, to be responsible for more responsibilities. And so we can understand that as we look there. A blessing of being in a healthy body is indeed a wonderful blessing. I thought, I've thought of many, many times of how wonderful God has been to me personally, myself, in having visited many people in the, in the nursing homes and in their homes confined to the bed or in the hospital undergoing operations and treatments and therapies and things of that nature. And I realize how good God has been to me in so many ways. There's so many things in a body that can go wrong and that we become unhealthy. And it costs us a lot of time. It costs us a lot of suffering. It costs us a lot of pain. It costs us a lot of money. And yet, when you have a healthy body, it's a blessing. Well, I want you to know the church of Jesus Christ is to be a healthy body. Yes, by being God's people, we become aware of this rich and wonderful blessing of being in a body of which Jesus is the head and the provider and the protector with the great power that he has. Point number one tonight being in a healthy body is being rewarded because the head of the body considers what is best for the body to be fed and to be nourished with. That's the way the church of Christ is. We don't know what to feed the church until we go to God's recipe book and we can find out what the church is to be fed. We can see that we feed the church and and the church is nourished by the living water. We, feed, we, we see that we can feed upon the wonderful word of life. Jesus said, blessed he that hunger and thirst after righteousness, he should be filled. We, we can feed the church righteousness and godliness and holiness and purity. Yes, we can feed. And the head of the body considers what is best for the body to be fed and to be nourished with. And that's the blessing of being in the church of Christ because in the church of Christ, let me tell you something, the head, Jesus Christ, is very considerate of every member of the body. You realize in some religions, the head of those religions, do you realize that they abuse their people? 
Do you realize that they assault their people? Do you realize sometimes they've even killed their people? They put their people in bondage. They put great yokes of bondage over them, but not in the Lord's body. It's a blessing in being in this healthy body. Jesus Christ is ahead of this body. And point number two, the head goes about to procure the best of foods and nourishment for it. The bread of life. There's nothing like it. I think we see that uh, as shared with us a long time ago when God provided the manna from heaven. Every morning they went out and this fresh manna came from heaven. And they had enough to last them all day long. It lasted them till the next morning. And you know on Friday morning they went out and they, if they needed, let's say they needed uh, maybe 12 omers of, of, uh, of this uh, uh, bread or this rather this manna from heaven, why they, they went out and they needed 12, well they gathered 24 because there wasn't going to be any on the Sabbath day. The Lord started on the first day of the week and he, he continued to pass that out to them and give that to them fresh and new every morning all the way through Friday, the sixth day. But on the seventh day, he had them to rest and remember, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I brought you out of bondage and I want you to remember that I'm the Lord your God and I have fed you, I've clothed you, I've protected you, I've been your power, I've been your watch and eye at night, I've been your guide and shield in the daytime. I want you to understand who I am. You stay home and you read and study and you be reminded of what I've done for you. I'm the head of this is the kingdom which is my body and God's people. So the head goes about to procure the best food and the nourishment for it. And you know the people even today are much likened to the people back then. They got so tired of eating the same old thing day after day after day. But it was what they needed. It was best for them. But they still complained. And so God sent them quail. It's called, I believe today, they call it Pharaoh's quail. And, and that, you think of that, the quail came in from everywhere. They just filled they just filled the, the countryside and they went out and they ate the, the, the quail that God sent to them and it was good for them and it nourished them. Well, in the same sense, that's the way that the Lord has fed us in the church. Tell me what can we read and study from Paul's writing that's not good for us, that's not nourishing for us. Even with all of the warnings and all of the negative input of what we should and should not do. It's still good for us. It's a blessing. That's the reason there's a blessing to those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. For said they'll see God. There isn't anything in the nourishment that Jesus Christ is the head of the church has given to us that will make us immoral people. I shudder to think about the people that are in Roman Catholicism and the religions of orthodoxy and, and some of the pagan religions to where that their children have to undergo such terrible treatment. They don't allow their preachers to marry. And they make out of their preachers covetous people. They make them um, wicked fornicators. They, they make them abusers of children and abusers of women. It's horrible the way they live and the lives that they protect and how that they have upheld that. Let me tell you something. In the church of Jesus Christ, there's no doctrine that leads people into immorality. In fact, the apostle Paul said to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and every wife have her own husband. If that's what the desire of the physical man is the Lord has provided a way within the holy matrimonial bounds to fulfill the desires of the physical body of man. God's guidelines are best. It keeps the church healthy. It doesn't destroy the church. Number three, the head then has the food prepared by the body or someone capable of preparing it. God the Father sent His Son, and who is Jesus Christ? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the Word that we feed upon. John tells us in John chapter 1, The Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
And so as we look at the head, Christ preparing the food for the body, the church. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand and know the Word of God. We're told to study the Word of God. It is that lamp to our feet and the light to our pathway, but it is the food from heaven. It is the nourishment for the soul. It is the eye salve that we may see. It is the clothing that we may not reveal our nakedness. And oh, how God's Word is needed so much today by so many today. Number four. It is then brought, this food from the head. It is then bought rather, or brought rather, or received rather, to feed the body what will be a great blessing to it. Paul's food nourishes the body. That's the reason Peter talked about growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It puts us to the place where that we as Paul identified we can eat meat not just milk but we can eat meat and strong meat belong to those that are full of age who by exercise of their senses they can discern good from evil this food that the Lord Jesus Christ has provided for the body it makes us strong in the Lord and in the power of his might it makes us capable fighters and soldiers in the body of Christ. So the food is fed to the body and what a great blessing it is to it. Number five, the head has the hands to deliver it to the mouth and the mouth receives it and feeds upon it. The rest of the body is affected by the good or the bad taste. The good are the bad ingredients. I'm talking now physically just a moment. Our minds choose what we ingest into our bodies. It may make the wrong decisions. Individuals have eaten things to the poisoning and destruction of their body. But let me tell you something. The body of Christ, if they eat what he has shared with us, it will never destroy us. Never destroy us. It won't harm us. Godliness is proper in all things, having a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So the rest of the body is affected by the good taste and the good ingredients are the bad taste and the bad ingredients. All members of the body are directly or indirectly Affected by what the head decides about what it will or will not consume. The body cannot consume anything until the head decides to give the commands to the hand, the mouth, and the rest of the body to accept it, to chew it, to consume it, and to be blessed or destroyed as a result of it. I was reading of some young folks years ago that you just think, you, you just don't know where in the world that they would come up with thoughts like that or decisions and make decisions like that. They decided they, they, they had lived about any with and taken about every other thing. They just never had tried. That new drug that everybody was talking about would really give you a great high. And it was talking about the the drug of Drano. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine kids or anybody taking Drano, taking a capsule, pouring out what was in the capsule, and putting Drano in the capsule, putting it back together, and taking that? It ate their stomach up. Shouldn't they have known that? I don't know the mentality of an individual is like that. Let me tell you something. The body of Christ won't do that. Because Jesus is the head of the body. Jesus will, Jesus will not put in the body what will destroy it. And I want you to think about that underlying wonderful point and principle. The head is the provider of the body. The head is the protector of the rest of the body. Life and death are tied to the decisions of the head of the body. 
what the head allows and the, what the, the head decides that the body will be fed with and will accept is going to decide the future of that body. It stays, the head does, aware of the well-being of all body parts as much as it is aware of. Now physically, we may not know that something will destroy us. Years ago, there, there was a new building product that hit the market and it began to take hold all over the land and all over the world. And people began to saw it and shape it and nail it up on the sides of the houses. And then they found out asbestos was one of the most deadly things that could be breed. And many individuals died a very young death because of the dust of asbestos. You know what? The Lord Jesus Christ has never allowed the church to breathe anything like asbestos. He's never fed us with anything like that. And the Lord has never let us look at anything that will destroy the body. He's never let us smell of anything that will destroy the body. He's never let us taste of anything that will destroy the body. You see, we're members of a protected institution. We're members of a protected institution. Let's get to another point now. He allows nothing that will harm it, poison it, yet has given ample and great information about what it is to live on and to be nourished by. You see, if the body receives an organ transplant or if it accepts another member into it, rest assured, brethren, Rest assured, unlike individuals in the physical realm, I remember when I was a boy, I remember them begin to talk about that they were one day going to be able to take the blood pump out of one person that had become diseased and they were going to be able to replace it with a blood pump of another person that had died and gave up their blood pump and they even said, you know, They'll take a blood pump out of a woman and put it in as a blood pump into a man and he'll still think like a man, act like a man, talk like a man, walk like a man, and do like a man. I thought that's going to be amazing. And you know it happened. And they, just, they do it a lot now. But you know one thing that they found out very early on and I was kind of interested in that and talked, you know, read about it and heard things talked about it. Did you know that even though they tried their best to get organ donors that were healthy and that, you know, that, that would be able to pass on something that was good. I mean, this is a life-threatening operation, though it could be a life-receiving, a sustaining operation. They would bring various organs into people's bodies and, you know, they weren't able to know that that organ was already diseased with diabetes or other infections. And the individual, I talked to a gentleman last year. His wife died a few years ago with cancer and, and uh, he began to go to treatment uh, for his kidney. And he said, you know, while I was in uh, treatment for my kidney on dialysis and everything, he said, I... I met this wonderful lady and said, you know, she, she and I began to have a, a wonderful time together and, and it developed into a nice relationship. And he said, Steve, in two weeks I'm going to get married. And uh, I said, well, that's wonderful. And he said, and by the way, he said, you know what? She's given me one of, one of her kidneys. And so he accepted her, her kidney. They did get married and then... I talked to him a few months later. He said, you know, found out she has diabetes. And he says, I've got diabetes now. You know, the best that the doctors and the nurses and those in the medical field can do is they study and they, they check and all of that. They still can't find everything that's wrong with an organ that's being donated. But I'm telling you this. In the body of Christ, as we become members of it, do you realize that the Lord 
will not bring any members into the body of Christ that's going to infect the rest of the members. He knows. He knows. And do you know he's given guidelines about things that can be brought into the body? He's given guidelines. Nothing can be brought into the body until the old man passes away and all things become new. And when that organ comes into the body and becomes diseased and it's going to destroy the rest of the body, do you know the church has a responsibility to be those who remove it from the body? We've had several people down home that decided that they're going to live for the devil. And we've had to let them know we can't any longer use you as part of the body of Christ. We, we don't recognize you as the body of Christ here in our congregation anymore. And they understand why. I guess at least most of them do. They recognize that we, we don't agree. We don't believe in the same doctrine. We don't walk the same path. We don't, we don't go by the same message. And so you can see if the body receives an organ transplant... It can bring in a bad one that's already infected, but not in the body of Christ. Not in that which Jesus is the head of. I notice there, the Lord will remove always the members that are poisoned to the body. Listen to Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. Paul says, brethren, don't yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And that word instrument there of righteousness is it's literally arms or weapons. Use your eyes as a weapon for God, not against the church. Your eyes can be used as a weapon against the truth, as a weapon against the body of Christ. The eyes of Demas were taken and changed and refocused and had a different aim and they became a weapon of destruction. Let me tell you something. God removed Demas from the body. He didn't let him stay in there. Ananias and Sapphira allowed their eyes and their mind to be infected with an infectious disease called covetousness, just like Demas did. And did you know God killed them? They became liars. They became covetous people. They began to love money. And they were removed. Do you see we can't yield our members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin and stay in the body of Christ because as the Lord puts all of the members and adds all the members and sets all the members in the church as it pleases Him, He also removes them when they seek to contaminate and destroy the body. Matthew 5, 29, 30, Jesus said, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Cast it from thee, for it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand defend thee, cut it off. Cast it from thee, for it is profitable for that thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Can we see that he... He's not talking only the physical body in that sense. No, his stronger teaching and greater message is you need to think about who you are as a member of the body of Christ. And you need to remember this also the Lord's saying. You can be removed. If you're going to lead the church into destruction, you can be removed. And if the church doesn't do it, the Lord will anyway. The Lord will anyway. When the Lord identifies what kills the person, be aware. It's going to happen that way. Romans 7 and 5 says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions, 
Now the word motions of sin means the passions of sin. Literally the strong abiding desires. That was a great passion for sin that Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. It was a great passion for sin that Demas walked away from the church after being a faithful servant of God. He said there that Paul said when we were in the flesh, the, the motions of sin worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But the Lord won't let that kind of member stay in the church. He'll sever it. He'll sever it from the body. Now the body of the church, the local congregation may not. But how foolish to allow one who would be under the motions of sin to, to, to have influence over any part of the body. When one is in the unconverted condition, under the influence of the natural man, and under the influence of the nature of man without God. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. Man without Christ is nothing. Nothing eternally, nothing worthwhile, nothing of value to himself and to others. Only in the law and guidance of Christ is there hope and deliverance for in the body of Christ these are not allowed. You see, one of the blessings of being in the family of God is to be where there's great and wonderful protection. Don't we appreciate? Don't we appreciate the holiness of our brethren? Don't we appreciate the modesty of our brethren? Don't we appreciate the shamefacedness of our brethren? Don't we appreciate the godly thinking of our brethren? Don't we appreciate the good language of our brethren? Don't we appreciate the honesty of our brethren? Don't we appreciate the faithfulness of our brethren? Don't we appreciate the trustability of our brethren? All of those are benefits of being in the body. We don't have to worry about one of our brothers running off with our wives or doing one of our children wrong because the body of Christ is a protected body. It's a faithful body. Blessed are the pure in heart. That's who God's people are. And if we aren't, we need to change. We need to change. Blessed in the pure in heart, they're going to see God. God's people hunger and thirst after righteousness. God's people are ready to every good work. God's people study to show themselves the proven to God. God's people grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's people add to the faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. Notice that which is love. Because that makes us where we are fruitful in the knowledge of Christ. The Lord identifies what kills the person. Only Jesus Christ and His faithfulness living and being lived out in our life can remove one from the indulgences and the desires of evil. Paul said in Romans 7, 23, now think about this. This is, a, this is a great prophet of God. He's a great apostle of Jesus Christ. He greatly evangelized the word of the Lord. Look what he says. I see another law in my members. Look at this members here. Look at this. I see another law warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You see, the Lord takes us, and He makes us what we have not been. No longer for self, but always and only for Him. The Lord has set all of the members in the body as it pleased Him. Lord, what's the work you want me to do should be our desire. It's the blessings of being in the body of Christ. In Hebrews 8 and 10, Paul writes here, and he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. This is quoting here what God said to His people back a long time ago. Identifying the great strength that we could have 
when the mind of God rules over the body and its members. And that's what the church is. It is the mind of God ruling over the one body made up of many members in which God has put those members in the body as it pleased Him and the Lord added them to the body as it pleased Him. Hebrews 8.10 this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their minds. I'll write them into their hearts. And I'll be to them a God. And they shall be to me a people. The old preacher asked another person there. Just a regular old time Christian, I guess. So what does it mean for you to be a Christian? He said, you know, I'm not a real smart man. I never have gone too far in school. But I've observed nature. I've learned from life. And I think I can tell you in a very simple way what it means to be a Christian. Well, what is it to be a Christian? He said, well, he said, you know, being a Christian means you've changed wells. Preacher said, what? Yeah, he said, you changed wells. He said, you know, you don't have to change buckets to get better water. But you have to change wells. Now he said, you know, back when I live for the devil and live for myself and live for sin... He said, I was the bucket. And he said, the old devil would let me down in the well and I'd bring up that old bad poison water. He said, it was, oh, it tasted terrible. He said, it had a taste of gas and it had a taste of all oh, strong stuff. And he said, I didn't know any better. It's just what I was brought up on. But he said, you know, becoming a Christian, he said, it's like taking that bucket. It's been put down into the well. And he said, you know, the bucket can't bring up except what's in the well. Now he said, you know, when I became a Christian, I changed wells. Same old bucket. And they there let me down into a new well with living water. And oh, it tastes so much better. And he said, now that's what being a Christian is. You just become a different bucket going down in a different well and you're bringing up a different drink. That's exactly right. When we're added to the body of Christ, we quit, we quit drawing out of the devil's well, we quit being a bucket for the devil. The scripture doesn't call us buckets, but the, the example is there. We are earthen vessels. Earthen vessels. And we can hold what the devil puts in the vessel, or we can hold what the Lord puts in the vessel. But I want to tell you this. If you and I want to be members of the body of Christ, we will have to be what the Lord will use and have a place for. And in closing, I want to read to you some things that the Lord does not have a place for. In Romans chapter 1, Paul writes in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And let me just say, they didn't like to draw out of God's well. They didn't want themselves being used as a bucket for God. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. You see, in the body of Christ... The members are guided by the mind of Christ. Paul said we have the mind of Christ. But these individuals didn't want to be minding the mind that was right. So God gave them over to a different mind. And they began to do those things by the instruction of that mind which didn't want to do what God wanted them to do. And they began to do things which was not convenient. And you know when we... When we think of that 
God given them up to things that were not convenient. You just think about they were reaching or becoming something that wasn't as, as it ought to be. They were reaching for the wrong stuff. They were deciding to have the wrong thing. And as a result of not having the mind of Christ and the mind of God ruling in their lives, then they became filled. Their bucket from that evil well was filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, breaking covenants, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. That implacable means they wouldn't keep the word. They wouldn't hang on to what they promised, you see. And then God, after He gave them up, what a horrible relationship. But do you know what? They were no longer members in the body of Christ. Because Jesus was not their guide. He was not their mind. He was not their head. I hope that we'll all appreciate what we have as being members of the body of Christ. I think long time ago, there was eight souls that were satisfied with the mind of Christ. The mind of God. The mind of Christ is the mind of divinity. It's the mind of God. As God gave that great instruction to Noah and his family to build something that was just unheard of in its day. It was an enormous undertaking. It was an undertaking that people wouldn't understand. It was doing the kind of work that no one agreed with. And they mocked at him. But he was a preacher of righteousness. And preaching what's right with God saved his soul. We're here tonight. We're here tonight. Because a man was satisfied to just simply be a member in the body of God. And let God place him where he needed to be. And be satisfied with the work he was given to do. He wasn't as some would think. And you know we live in a time like that today. When some individuals they, they, they would kind of like a liver that didn't want to be a liver. It wanted to be a lung you know. They're miserable. They don't like that fact that God won't let them be an apostle. So they just established them a, re a religion where they can have the work of an apostle. And then some religions even establish the office of apostles today in their religion. They aren't satisfied with what the Lord has done. And so they just, they just go against His will. They just do what they want to do. And they set themselves. But that's, that's a person that's implacable. That's an person that won't stick with the will and the word of God. Let's be satisfied tonight to, to hold our position and to do our work and to obey and be faithful in our position whatever we can do. Don't be miserable if somebody else is a five talent person and you are a two or a one. Don't be miserable if you can't be an apostle, if you can't be an inspired prophet, if you can't speak in tongues. If you can't raise the dead, if you can't drink poison, don't be miserable. The Lord still has need for you. And I think of myself as one of those uncomely parts, but I'm sure thankful that the Lord said He was going to honor to even the uncomely parts as He sets them as members in the body of Christ. Let's be faithful to death. We know who wins. We've read the last chapters of the Bible. We've heard the messages and the promises of Jesus. We know what Daniel saw in prophecy. The end of the world and John the Revelator saw in that panoramic view of the end time scene. Let's be faithful to death. 
and just be satisfied to be members of the Lord's church and let him be the head, let him have his way, and let's always listen to his say and be faithful unto death. That's our study tonight. You might think about who you are and where you are, and you might decide that you're not where you want to be. Sometimes people take roads and it leads them to places where they didn't think they were going to end up. And we might ask our own selves, on the road we're going, in the direction we're taking, when we get to where we are going, are we going to be where we want to be? That's a good question. And if not, while there is time, while there is mercy, while there is opportunity, and while you have a desire, make your life right with God, won't you, to get as we sing the selected number.